2019 speech night. My name is Ryan Guy, and I'm one of the directors of Speech and Debate here at Modesto Junior College. We have a really fantastic set of events uh, ready for you tonight. But before we get into all that, I just have a couple of quick announcements and a little bit of history for you all. First off, my guess is most of you have one of these devices in your pocket. For safety reasons, we ask folks to go ahead and turn those to silence so that we don't have ringers going off in the middle of the show, probably something I should do too. Um, but also, it's a distraction that we don't want to have our performers having to deal with and don't want someone taking a fall up on, uh, on stage. So we appreciate that. Second announcement is if you are here for a communication studies class requirement, you should go ahead and complete whatever assignment your professor gave to you. I will note that many professors ask their students to fill out one of these critique sheets that has a side to write a little bit about the speeches and then a back side to go ahead and write a little bit about the debate. If you need one of these, we've got a bunch of them up front at the tables in the, uh, in the lobby and they'll be there both during and after the show for you to pick up. Well, folks, I just want to give you a little bit of history about the Modesto Junior College speech and debate team. The MJC speech and debate team is one of the oldest programs on this campus. We actually got our start one year after the college opened, which means we too are coming up on our 100 year anniversary of doing what it is that we do. Over the course of tonight, you're gonna to have an opportunity to both witness some of our public, uh, public speaking and rhetoric activities that these individuals on the team do over the course of the academic year. A little bit of background about intercollegiate forensics. And so the individuals that you are going to see tonight are all members of NJC's speech and debate team. In addition to being part of a class, these individuals actually train their skills in public oratory to travel to tournaments all over California and even the United States as we get into our national competition. And so you've got some really fantastically talented individuals tonight performing everything from impromptu speaking to platform speeches, oral interpretation, and of course debate. But an interesting fact about these folks is that many of them actually got their introduction into forensics the same place that you all are all sitting right now, which means at a speech night here at Modesto Junior College. So if over the course of the evening, as you're watching some of these events, you start thinking to yourself, you know what, this is something that I think I could be good at, and I want to train my public speaking, speaking skills. I want to work on finding my voice. I encourage you to come talk to any of the individuals on our team after the show, and they can give you some background and some information of what it's like to join. We are currently actively recruiting folks to join our team in the fall. So if this is something you're interested in, I really encourage you to let me uh, let us know, and we'll get you, uh, get you plugged into that. Well, that is enough for me. Without further, uh, further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to our co-director of forensics, Professor Tori Shep, to introduce the MJC Speech and Debate Team to you all. Have a fantastic show. Good evening. Tonight it is my privilege to introduce you to all of the members of the Speech and Debate Team. Before I do that, I want to acknowledge the hard work of our volunteer student coach, Sean Cox Marcelin. He spends what little free time he has attending our practices and spending long weekends at tournaments with us. So if we could all give him a round of applause, that would be great. All right, and please help me welcome each member of the speech and debate team to the stage, Brett Andrade. Austin Castro. Beto Franco. Samuel Garcia, Alexis Gerardo, Sabrina Gonzalez, Gavin Gould Clark, Jacqueline Kim, Jordan Johnson, Sarah Landeros, Victor Lumidal, Kendra McKinley, David McKinley, Nicholas O'Donnell, Mackenzie Sice, Ethan Spikes, and Derek Cristeo. Let's give these folks a big round of applause. Tonight you will see several wonderful performances from many of these individuals. And to start the show, I'm going to turn it over to our two trusty masters of ceremony, Sabrina Gonzalez and Jordan Johnson. All 
right, everybody. Thank you guys for all coming out and welcome to 2019 Speech Night. We have some wonderful, wonderful performances for you today. Our first speech of the night will be an informative speech. This speech seeks to help the audience understand a topic more fully by providing descriptive examples. And our first speaker today will be Victor Lumadao. He is a communication studies major. He's in his fourth semester. And a fun fact about him, he is a personal chef to the elderly. Everybody, let's give it up for Victor. Do you ever feel like a plastic bag just floating through the wind, wanting to start again? Yes, those are Katy Perry lyrics. But let me tell you why those words resonate so deep within your bones. It's because you are what you eat, and you've been eating plastic throughout your entire life. Plastic is something we're all familiar with. It's in the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, and in our favorite celebrities' faces. <laughs> Uses are endless. It's cheap, versatile, and efficient. Our lives are consumed by it. Today I'll be talking about how just about every day, we are literally consuming plastic through salt. So first, let's crystallize a better idea about how much salt and plastic we ingest. Second, let's break down how salt absorbs plastic. And finally, let's digest the environmental and health impacts of plastics. Salt is essential for life in general. And saltiness is one of the basic human tastes and emotions. <laughs> salt is one of the oldest and most ubiquitous food seasonings, and salting is an important part of food preservation. However, despite the critical functions that salt serves, there are two key trends that should make us wary. The overconsumption of salt and its contamination with plastic. In 2013, the CDC wrote that in the United States, 75% of the sodium eaten comes from processed and restaurant foods, 11% from cooking and table use, and the rest from what's found naturally in foods. In 2018, the FDA recommended that the general population consume no more than 2.3 grams of sodium per day, which is about a teaspoon of table salt. The British Medical Journal in 2017 states that the habitual salt intake in many Western countries is 10 grams per day. It's even higher than that in countries in Eastern Europe and Asia. So not only do we consume far above the recommended intake of salt, but the salt we eat is also contaminated. Jessica Glenza wrote in The Guardian in 2018 that sea salt around the world has been contaminated by plastic pollution adding to experts' fears that microplastics are becoming ubiquitous in the environment and finding their way into the food chain via the salt in our diets. Microplastics are small pieces of plastic that pollute the environment. And while there is some contention over their size, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration classified microplastics as being less than five millimeters in diameter. Researchers believe the majority of microplastics come from fibers from clothing and single-use plastics such as water bottles and straws. A study in 2018, led by Sherry Mason from the State University of New York at Fredonia, found that the average American consumes 2,000 microplastic pieces per year due to the presence of plastic in the oceans and lakes. So we know that we consume high amounts of salt and plastic. Let me just sprinkle some knowledge about how the salt absorbs the plastic in the first place. The oceans are under assault. <laughs> There are two key factors in this crime against nature, the mismanagement of plastic waste and the natural process of salt formation. A world without plastic is unimaginable today, even though it began its mass production less than 70 years ago. In 2017, Nature Research Journal explains that since its mass production in the 1950s, global plastic production has been increasing, which exceeded 322 million tons in 2015. Roughly 40% of the plastic produced each year is disposable. Much of it used as packaging intended to be discarded within minutes after purchase. In 2018, Laura Parker wrote an article in National Geographic stating that plastic production has grown at such a breakneck pace that virtually half the plastic ever manufactured has been made in the past 15 years. Parker also says that last year, the Coca-Cola company, perhaps the world's largest producer of plastic bottles, Acknowledge for the first time just how many it makes. 128 billion a year. Nestle, Pepsi, and others also churn out torrents of bottles. Some of the features of plastic that make it so attractive from a manufacturing standpoint are concerned when it comes to how it affects the environment. The growth of plastic production 
has far outstripped the ability of waste management to keep up. And the reality is, this means that mismanaged plastic waste will find its way to the ocean. In 2018, Elizabeth Royt wrote an article in National Geographic stating that no one knows exactly how much plastic waste ends up in the ocean. Despite lack of clear numbers, some estimates have been suggested. Jenna Jambeck, a University of Georgia engineering professor, caught everybody's attention with a rough calculation. Between 5.3 million and 14 million tons each year, just from coastal regions. Most of it isn't thrown off ships, she and her colleagues say, but it's dumped carelessly on land or in rivers, mostly in Asia. It's then blown or washed into the sea. And as plastics do deteriorate, they create the microplastics mentioned earlier. In turn, these become part of the ocean's creation of sea salt. In 2017, Nature Research Journal explains that commercial sea and lake salts are mainly produced through a crystallization process as a result of seawater evaporation or naturally occurring brine under the combined effects of sunlight, heat, or wind. So we see that plastic contaminates the sea salt we consume, and we broke down how that process happens. Let's uh, chow down on some of the implications. Life in plastic, it's fantastic. However, there are two key implications, the environment and health. There's plastic in the air, water, the seafood we eat, the beer we drink, the salt we use. Plastics are just everywhere. A 2018 article in The Guardian by Damian Carrington states that a million plastic bottles are bought around the world every minute. And scientists predict that by 2050, the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. Imagine. Five plastic grocery bags stuffed with plastic trash sitting on every foot of coastline around the world. That would correspond to about 8.8 .8 million tons, which is the middle of the road estimate of what the oceans get from us annually. It's unclear how long it'll take for this plastic to completely biodegrade into its constituent molecules. Estimates range from 450 years to never. And the health impact of ingesting plastic is not known. Scientists have struggled to research the impact of plastic on the human body because they cannot find a control group of humans who have not been exposed. Everybody is being exposed to some degree at any given time, from gestation through death. Researchers from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Arizona State University wrote in 2015 that detectable levels of the plastic bisphenol A have been found in 95% of the adult population in the United States. There's no clear effect on human health, because there are no studies on that subject, said Juan Canessa, a professor who conducted research on sea salt at the University of Alicante in Spain. But the increase of plastics in the environment in general will also increase exposure, he said. So today, we chewed over the world's contamination of salt by discussing the overconsumption of salt, how salt absorbs plastic, and some of the lasting implications. It's certain that plastic has its place in the world. But it being mismanaged has led to the plastic infiltrating the Earth's salt supply. You are what you eat. So maybe you do feel like a plastic bag just floating through the wind wanting to start again. Plastic is a double-edged sword. Its benefits are also its weaknesses. And despite the environmental and potential health impacts, we're still waiting on the final straw to change our plastic consumption, both figuratively and literally. speech, Victor. I learned a lot. I mean, maybe this explains why you're so salty. Y'all see what I have to put up with every day? Well, let's go ahead and move on to our next speech, and that is an impromptu speech. The speaker has seven minutes to prepare and deliver a well-organized, insightful speech. They must choose one of three topics. Today, our speaker for impromptu will be Austin Castro. Austin is a cinema and television arts major. This is his fourth semester on the team. And a fun fact about Austin is that he's appeared on the Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why. Let's give a warm welcome to Austin Castro. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the crowd, in impromptu speaking, the speaker has two minutes to prepare his speech before he delivers it. So I ask in this time if you guys can please remain quiet as our speaker prepares. Thank you. Starting time.
30 seconds used. One minute used. Minute thirty used. When it comes to Asian stereotypes, believe me, I've heard it all. Whether that is, oh, you must be really good at math, to you're probably not the best driver, to oh, have you tasted dog before? I know. The answer to that is no, yes, and at least not yet. <laughs> However, one of the biggest Asian stereotypes I hear is, you must disappoint your parents pretty easily. Whether or not that's a reality, that's another issue. But what I'm trying to get here is that ultimately things don't always work out. And that idea is reminiscent of the quotation I received today. Always get married early in the morning. That way, if it doesn't work out, you haven't wasted a whole day by Mickey Rooney. <laughs> and the way I interpreted that is you really have to have a plan B for when things don't work out. And that is something that is inherently true in our DNA. Ultimately, you never know when life might throw you a curveball, And so you always got to be prepared for whatever is coming next. And so today, we're going to analyze that idea through three key lenses of analysis. First, Get ready to turn on the TV and watch a cartoon classic, SpongeBob SquarePants. Second, let's watch a little bit of Netflix and talk about a famous rom-com called To All the Boys I Loved Before. And finally, we'll finish off with a movie that's extremely popular called Bird Box. So first, let's go ahead and watch something that a lot of people have probably seen, SpongeBob. Now, if there's anyone who knows disappointment, it's probably SpongeBob. I mean, let's face it. Basically every episode, he's faced with some kind of challenge because he's trying to ultimately work towards a goal, but there's some kind of obstacle that he's forced to face. One of the prime examples is when he's trying to play at the Bubble Bowl. Of course, he wants to help Squidward as much as possible and brings along as many people as he can. However, we quickly learn that mayonnaise is not an instrument and many of the people involved really don't have any musical talents. Now, despite that realization, SpongeBob works countless hours and nights to work and become better. And by the time they get to the bubble bowl, they become one of the biggest acts ever. They're so good, in fact, that they basically played the Super Bowl just last week. Although, for some reason, they were rudely interrupted by sicko mode. That's another story. <laughs> SpongeBob is a prime example of how we can turn something negative into a positive, and that's something that we all should do in our everyday life. So now that we watched a little bit of cartoons, let's change the genre a little bit and talk about a movie called To All the Boys I Loved Before. Now, for those of you who have never seen the movie, it is a great rom-com talking about this girl named Lara Jean in high school. Now, what Lara Jean does is she writes letters to all the boys she's loved before. Now, of course, she decides not to send them and writes them kind of, get to, kind of to just get her feelings out. But what she ends up finding out is they end up getting sent off to the boy that she didn't love before. Now you may think this might be the end of the world and that there's no way to recover from this. However, Lara Jean manages to make it work as she comes across a boy named Peter Kavinsky. What we see next is, while it may not be the most ideal situation, Lara Jean and Peter Kavinsky ultimately blossom into something that could be more. And so what Lara Jean did is she turned something that wasn't what she expected and turned it into something that really could potentially be more. 
without hopefully giving away any spoilers, you'll have to see what happens next because Lara Jean and Peter really work their way out through this really convoluted situation. And I'm sure you can imagine getting a letter like that sent out would probably be a little traumatizing. So now that we've talked about to all the boys I loved before, let's go ahead and do the bird box challenge as we make our way over. Okay, we're good. <laughs> to our final quote, a final example, bird box. Now, Bird Box is very different from our last two examples in that it's basically a post-apocalyptic thriller and basically everyone in the world is dying. We follow the story of Mallory, who is this girl that finds herself in the middle of this apocalyptic event. Basically what's happening is the people all across the world are seeing this supernatural figure that when they see it, makes them commit suicide. Now, as far convoluted as that sound, this is the situation she's forced to deal with. Ultimately, she has to make the most of what's going on because her survival is at stake. She finds herself in this situation where basically she's fighting for her life, just trying to get food, water, shelter, whatever it takes. I think it's safe to say that Mallory had no way to expect this, but ultimately we see that she does whatever it takes and is not afraid to make things work, no matter what curveball is thrown at her. So when we look back at the quotation we received today, Always get married early in the morning. That way, if it doesn't work out, you haven't wasted a whole day by Mickey Rooney. And again, I interpreted that to mean that if things don't work out, have a plan B. Today we analyzed that idea through the examples of SpongeBob SquarePants to all the boys I loved before and the movie Bird Box. And so, while I may or may not be a disappointment to my parents, I know that when it comes to life's curves balls, I'll always have a plan B because Let's face it, life isn't as straight as it might seem, and you never know when that curveball just might hit you. Thank you, Austin, so much for that wonderful speech. I, I don't think I could have done that. <laughs> so before we can continue on with our individual speeches, I'm going to ask our four debaters to come up so they can pick the sides. The really cool part about seeing a live parliamentary debate is even our debaters don't know which sides they'll be on, affirmative or negative, or what they'll be debating. Alexis, will you call our coin flip in the air, please? All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Ready? Oh, what do we got here? Heads it is! Dang, let's go. Okay, Alexis and Nick, which side would you like? Okay, they will be negative. Let's see our resolution. And the resolution is, the United States should significantly increase the efforts to establish a permanent colony, of, uh, colony on Mars. How intriguing. Wow. <laughs> what an alien idea. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was really cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next up in our lineup, we will have a poetry. This oral interpretation presents literature that seeks to move the audience through character portrayal and storytelling. And the person that's going to be giving this wonderful poetry is none other than Kendra McKinley. She's in her third semester. She is a psychology major. And a fun fact about her is that her cats can play fetch. Isn't that just amazing? Everybody give it up for Kendra. vitamin B12. You see, I won't end up like them. Now, 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 I remember trips to South Carolina. I remember Lenny Williams' is cause I love you. I remember trees become so clumsy in the fall. I remember getting the news. I remember holding my mother upright. I remember knees succumbing to sentences. I remember unsettling cackles. I remember never wearing that dress again. I remember him being so stoic. Statuesque. He has his mother's quiet. 
You can see it in his beard and the way that he tries to shush the grave, my dad, holding on to synopsis for dear life, pleading to still have the option of being ashamed of his sins one day. You see, Nana, Nana don't talk no more. Used to have Holden Caulfield in her speech. Now she sounds like missed phone calls. It's all leaving Every decision, every regret, a burning cradle as she dives into oblivion. At first, <clears throat> the National Institute on Aging classifies Alzheimer's disease as an irreversible progressive brain disorder that slowly destroys memories, thinking skills, and the ability to carry out the simplest task. In 2017, the CDC ranked Alzheimer's disease as the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, killing 111,561 men and women each year. Even more shocking, a 2018 Science.org article, molecular biologist Darren Baker explains to us that Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias will inflict an estimated 14 million people in this country alone by the year 2050. Enticed by these predictions, Congress has recently tripled the National Institute on Health's annual budget for Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias to $1.9 billion. Finally, giving the next generation a little bit of hope. Through the poetry, Blue Jeans by Marvin Hodge, Rubik's Cube by Benjamin Barker, and then Fear of My Mother Being Diagnosed with Alzheimer's Disease by Megan Fally, a program for those grieving the loss of someone who's still alive. For my sixth birthday, my grandpa gave me a Rubik's Cube. I'll always remember its edges. Hold it in my hand, heft the weight of an overwhelming problem. I remember him telling me about it, how a Rubik's Cube has 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 6 trillion, 499 million, 856 thousand possibilities. He told me it could be really confusing sometimes, but to always look at the center square as a reminder of what color each side should be. I knew it finally came for you when I got the phone call. You were parked outside of someone else's life, car still running. For years, you call me by my brother's name and then the dogs, and soon the name of your mother dead long before I was born. We're celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary. He and Grandpa are dancing a dance and only fragile legs and wrinkled hands know how to. That type of happiness took him 70 years to earn. The white side of the cube is solved. This disease thinks so highly of itself. It sits in interrogation and says, I ain't snitching on nobody. And Grandpa, he's got it too. You know, I never correct him when he gets my name wrong. At least I remind him of someone, right? It's good practice. He went blind a few years before his diagnosis. Smart, that's how I do it. Do not be confused the world out there with the world in here. Everything stays exactly like I remember it. The walls of the hospital are blue. Nurses explain that his memory has become jumbled. Strangers in family portraits, pictures with mismatched faces. Alzheimer's has turned his mind into a Rubik's Cube. Most days, I have to tell you things 50 times. Mom, you're okay. I love you. They're not trying to kill you. I'm your daughter, the only one. I think of all the questions I should have asked before. I want to pluck the answers from your mouth, each memory a hair caught in the back of your throat. If I could do it all again, I would do it all again. He's a highway patrolman. His car is white. No, no, it's blue. He worked there for 30 years. Some nights he still does time. It's a complicated algorithm. I'd come back and I'd set the table for all the dinners I'd miss. I'd come back from all the Mother's Days I spent in different states. I'd shift my finger, hovering the ignore button. I would just answer your call. Mom, this is a fork. You use it like this. Mom, I love you. I love you, Annie. Annie is your name. My sister's wedding is white, but he doesn't know why. I wonder. When you flinch at the food, I am trying to spoon to you if you remember me how I was back then. 
The little girl who caught skin inside sweater zippers. The little girl who snuck out bedroom windows and stole your pills. I always wonder if you remember the time that I slammed the door so hard. It sounded like, I hate you. And the photograph of us fell off its nail. The pills he holds in his hands are yellow and green and red. The weight of their color causes his hair to drop. I try to shift his tiles back into place, but people do not have center squares. His mind is a hospital bed divided by zero. I've been running for this for so long. My soul needs a second wind. These incessant genes with a God complex giving and taking and she takes pride in her hips, but there's something she wishes she hadn't gone from her mama. Dad wishes it hadn't gone to his mama. The woman who made him man, disappearing without a wooden box, ain't that brandish the gall of these professional thieves to break into your home. While the sun is up, I mean, the idea is just ridiculous, right? Dying from a life you can't recall living. Mom, he's been dead for years. He loved you so much, Mom. He's gone forever. Do you hear me? Forever. Mom. He just, he just went to the store. I'll be back in five minutes. I don't know how to live with these things that I've done. These secrets of yours I told to make myself more interesting. This hurt that I polished until I could see my own reflection. Sad hugs are bad enough. Sad hugs from family members are far worse. I never thought I'd have to say, do you remember me? Grandma? Last time I saw you, you were this big. Happy birthday. Is it mine or yours, she says, and we laugh huh, uncomfortably together. She takes her jacket and puts it up to her nose, as if the clothes she's worn for years just smell like someone else. The temperature of his hand is blue. Death is colorless. I will always remember his edges. Hold him in my hand. As the weight of an overwhelming problem, I was unable to attend his funeral. I never figured out the algorithm to solve him. A Rubik's Cube has over 43 quintillion possibilities. A casket only has one. Thank you, Kendra, so much for that beautiful poetry. My grandfather has dementia himself, so that one really stucks at home. But we are going to continue on with our next speech, and that is persuasion speaking. This is a speech designed to change the audience's beliefs or to move them to action. Our speaker tonight will be Sarah Landreos. She's a communication studies major. This is her second semester on the team, and a fun fact about Sarah is that she has the cutest dog in the 209 area. Let's give it up for Sarah. Menstruation. For the course of human history, this monthly visitor is just a fact of life that billions of women and girls have to deal with. For many of us, it represents a minor inconvenience, but for women serving time in US prisons and jails, this basic biological fact becomes a monthly nightmare. Shandra Polzeko describes the ordeal of requiring basic feminine hygiene products to Women's Magazine in July of 2016. I think Orange is New Black has made it seem like commissary is a store, but actually, it's a very long process. You have to place an order a week ahead via slip, and if there's a mistake, which is fairly common, you just don't get your items. Today, I'm here to convince you that state and private prisons must end the practice of denying inmates access to basic feminine hygiene products. So today, we'll first examine the issues that come from limited access to menstrual products. Second, 
we'll explore the reasons this crisis exists before finally presenting some meaningful reforms to address this issue. First, the problem. Federal prisons provide free menstrual products to their inmates, but state and local facilities do not. This is troubling because according to an October 2017 report from the Prison Policy Institute, of the 200,000 women in prison, the vast majority, 186,000, are housed in state and local facilities. This creates two key problems. These facilities make menstrual products available, but they are often unaffordable and inaccessible. Balseco explains in the previously cited Women's Magazine article that there's a shortage of prison jobs. And even if you get one, you earn about 75 cents a day. So to have to spend $2.34 for 24 pads is a quarter of your weekly paycheck. Keeping in mind that you'd have to buy all other hygiene items that are basic to human existence. Additionally, the products are subpar. Women often twist several panty liners together into a makeshift tampon. Molly Nigren, a nurse who has worked with incarcerated women, warns in a 2018 interview with KJZZ that this can increase bacteria and cause toxic shock syndrome. Beyond this, the process to place and receive an order of hygiene products is so laborious that it could take weeks. This drives women to insanitary alternatives. Balzago explains, I've heard of women using notebook paper and even dirty shower sheets which were the little cut-up squares of old sheets everyone stood on on the bathroom floor after getting out of the shower. Despite, the, uh, despite a female inmate's best efforts to obtain hygiene products, a 2018 article on Prison Legal News by Derek Gilnick explains that bloodstained pants could earn her a disciplinary ticket for violating the prison system's dress code. Beyond disciplinary action, this impacts women in other ways too. A, 2008, a March 2018 report from NBC News explains, for example, some women refuse visits from attorneys or family members out of embarrassment about bleeding through clothing. Thus, our current practices are dangerous and demeaning. Women are increasing their risk of fatal infection by wearing the same pad for days at a time and then are subject to humiliation and discipline when the products fail them. This should make us take a hard look at ourselves. These are our values. This is justice? Despite the clear problem this poses, there are dysfunctional mindsets that contribute to these policies. So let's examine the causes. The causes are twofold. Our legislators continue to treat sanitary products as luxury items, and our institutions want to maintain biopolitical control over our female prisoners in the prison system. First, the issue of luxury. Our legislators continue to dismiss sanitary products as unworthy of their time. When Arizona introduced a bill to provide these menstrual products to their inmates, KJZZ reports that one committee member stated, I'm almost sorry I heard the bill. I expect to hear about pads and tampons and the problems of periods. Sadly, perhaps this shouldn't be surprising. According to a 2017 article on Bustle by Chris Tegnotti, only 46% of men believe that access to menstrual products are a right as opposed to a privilege. But imagine, imagine being told that the bathrooms at your school will no longer supply toilet paper for free. Instead, you will be required to pay for it. Once you do, you will need to wait several days to several weeks to receive your allotment. If the thought of this seems ridiculous or makes you uncomfortable, that's because it is, and it should. Sanitary products are necessary in this same way. Second, the issue of biopower. Michel Foucault describes biopower as state control that seeks to govern bodies and bodily rituals. Brenda V. Smith, a professor at the Washington College of Law at American University, tells the Huffington Post in 2018 that correction officers are the gatekeepers of sanitary products and that women end up trading sex for sanitary napkins. She continues saying, being able to manage your period is so basic for women. It's a matter of dignity. It really goes to the core of a woman's personhood. An unwillingness to provide menstrual products is less about a limited budget and more about the exertion of biopolitical control over our female prisoners in the prison system. Diminishing one's personhood seems to be the point. Now, it's true that addressing these root causes would require major shifts in how we fundamentally structure our society. However, there are concrete solutions we can implement in the meantime to resolve the symptoms of the problem. 
So let's examine the solutions. To solve this problem, it will take a multifaceted approach. First, the Federal Bureau of Prisons has a power to oversee both private and state-run facilities. In this instance, the Federal Bureau of Prisons should issue a directive that all private and state-run facilities must change their practices and policies regarding the availability and distribution of feminine hygiene products. It may sound cliche, but this is an ideal instance where writing to or calling your congressperson can have a measurable impact on the suffering of others. Next, at the local level. Change can be enacted through state legislature, or in the case of jails, at the county level. When we look at the states that have already changed their laws, there's one common factor, public pressure. States like Colorado, New York, Arizona, and Maryland have already taken steps to enact change and should serve as a model for the rest of us. A 2018 article in the Huffington Post by Lydia O'Connor points out that providing these products does not create a significant budgetary burden on the state. In Arizona, estimates suggest that the plan will only cost $80,000. On the following handout, I provided you links to websites where you can contact your federal, state, and county officials. I have left some copies in the lobby for you to pick up after the show is over, and I implore you to contact them. When you do, stress that you wish to see fair and equal distribution of feminine hygiene products to all incarcerated individuals who need them. Last, you can currently support organizations fighting for the rights of the incarcerated donating your time or money to organizations like the ACLU or the Human Rights Defense Center will help give resources to change the quality of lives of these individuals, particularly those incarcerated in other states and U.S. territories. Today, we looked at the inexcusably insufficient level of access that female prisoners have to menstrual products. We first examined the issues that come from limited, ex from limited access to menstrual products, then identified the contributing factors before finally presenting some obtainable solutions. Menstruation is a biological reality for billions of women. The practice of weaponizing a person's biology against them is a practice that must end. The United States has more incarcerated individuals than anywhere else in the world. Their voices are muted. We have to use ours to make them heard. Thank you, Sarah, for that speech. It's such an important topic, so thank you for bringing it to the forefront. However, that does end our in single events, so we're, I'm going to welcome up my debaters, and we're going to get this show on the road. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about parliamentary debates. This event puts two teams against each other. It follows the British House of Commons, and the audience participation is encouraged in the course how debate. Knock your arm on your armrest or say hear, hear when you hear the debaters make a good point. The teams are provided 20 minutes to help out their resolution before the debate begins. So starting on our affirmative side, we have the Prime Minister, Gavin Good. It's his third semester on the team. He is an English major interested in publication. And a fun fact about Gavin is that he enjoys playing video games for more than eight hours at a time. That sounds like a bad idea to me. And then we have Mackenzie. Mackenzie's major is in communications. She's in her second semester. And a fun fact about her is this is her last day feeling 22. Everybody, let's give it up for Mackenzie. It's her birthday. Going over to the negative side, we have Nicholas O'Donnell, who is the leader of opposition. Nick is a business major. It's his fourth semester on the team. And a fun fact about Nick is that he wishes he could Thanos snap when looking for MJC parking spots. And last, but definitely not least, our member of opposition is Alexis. She is a nursing major working towards becoming a physician's assistant. It's her second semester. And a fun fact about her is that she's really good at word and brain games, and she can do celebrity impressions. Give it up for our debaters. Debate is an interactive activity, so please knock, clap, stomp your feet, and say, hear, hear, if you think a debater is making a good point. Hear, hear. This will help keep things exciting while also letting the debaters know what arguments like and which arguments you don't. 
I now recognize the Prime Minister from the Affirmative Team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed four minutes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, negative team, thank you for, uh, for joining me up here. Everybody ready to talk about space? <laughs> All right, so if, uh, if everybody's ready, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. All right, so my first argumentation I'd like to make here is a quick anecdote. Stephen Hawking stated before he died that the, that the human race is expected to go extinct between, uh, in the next 400 to 1,000 years. Now, considering that we've been living as, like, the, as a, like a developed species for about 4,000, that's kind of a concern uh, that, uh, that it's expected to be coming so soon. Now, we're going to keep all of our kind of uh, technical momo jumbo to a minimum here, so we're going to kind of like try to explain things as we go along, for pe so people can kind of follow along. Um, but to but to put it simply, we're going to be looking at this round through the lens of net benefits. So basically, if we can prove to everybody in this room that we need to go to Mars, then you're going to be voting for the affirmative because uh, that it's good for the, that it's good for uh, the human race rather if we go if we go to Mars. If we fail to do that then uh, you'll vote for the negation. So, let's move on to a little background here. So, we, like, the discussion about going to Mars has been, uh, has been in, like, in talks for, men, for many years, most recently brought up through uh, Elon Musk in the last year or two. But however, he does, while he has the ambition and the drive, he kind of lacks the funding and the enforcement to actually get anything done besides sending like, Tesla Roadsters into space. So, um, the, uh, uh, this brings us to the plan, which, we're going to do exactly as the resolution states. We're intending for the United States federal government to uh, have to uh, initiate a plan to get uh, a pollination on Mars by by the year 2030. Um, so the way that we're going to fund this is generally through the normal is through your normal means of uh, raising funding, whether that be cutting from other programs, um, f uh, through tax through tax uh, through tax increases on the rich, etc. So. Move on to our advantage here. You can t basically look at this as a reason to vote for us. You can headline this, we need to get off the rock. <laughs> the uh, first argumentation we have here is that currently in status quo, the Earth's environment is not going to be uh, stable or usable forever. And then se our second point here is that the United Nations uh, stated la just uh, last year, or j sorry, just this year, that we have 12 years, only 12 years before climate, before uh, climate change as a, uh, like, like, as a whole becomes irreversible, meaning that Earth will become uninhabitable uh, over time. So, and our final, and our third, uh, and our third status quo point is essentially, even if we're starting, even if tomorrow we were to stop carbon emissions, the Earth would still increase in temperature by 1.5 degrees over that same time period. So there's no stopping that no matter what we do. So whatever the negation may try to articulate that we might be able to save it, we can't do it in time. So. This brings us to our, uh, if, we plan, if we pass the plan, if we feel that we're going to able to get people on Mars in this time frame, uh, whatever the cost is, then we are now able to start finding ways in order to survive and keep the human race from going absolutely extinct uh, on the planet that we live on now. So a couple impacts here, a couple like reasons to, to really uh, support the crux of our argument here is that we are avoiding the the basic extinction of the human race as a starting step, which is pretty good. Uh, and then secondly, in the status quo, if climate change continues to be an issue and continues to get worse, this is going to lead to wars being fought over the resources that we have containing left in the earth. So no matter what, eventually we're going to be getting into wars and we need to be able to withstand the existence of climate change because if we allow the, if we allow countries to fight and bicker over whether or not we should go to Mars, the window may close and it'll be too late. And at that point, we're all gonna be doomed regardless. So we might as well start now while we still have a chance. The negative now has one minute of flex time to ask questions of the affirmative team. Hello, all right, so when will we get to Mars? So we're expect we're setting a, a, a strict timeline around 2030. Do we have the technology to do that? So it's under development right now, like okay. similar Apollo program. Okay, how many people can go? What? Uh, who's going to get to go? 
Yeah. I mean, initially it's going to be, you know, a handful of astronauts, same as like Apollo, but the designation is eventually we'll have mass migration of people. You're gonna fit seven billion people on spaceships and get stuck. Not at once, but over time. It's the only option we have. Okay. Um, you know, Mars has no electromagnetic field, so won't everyone die like the next solar storm slash solar flare? We can worry. We can worry about like two super small magnitude possibilities once we actually like m manage to survive the real threat of climate change right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your right. I now recognize the leader of the opposition from the negative team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed five minutes. All right, I'm going to give you all a quick roadmap for those of you who are here because of a calm class. If not, just ignore what I'm about to say. So I'm going to start off by responding to the affirmative team's advantages. There's not really a whole lot to address at the top of the case since it was mostly anecdotal. And then I'm going to be addressing uh, a couple of disadvantages or some reasons why you guys should obviously be sticking with the status quo. Okay. I just want to make a point, if you'd like to go. That was the saddest speech I've ever heard. Not in the sense that it was poorly put together. It was well-researched, of course. It's sad as in, it's so bleak. Like, wow, what kind of picture are they painting for us? Like, oh, we're not really gonna be here that long. Might as well just move. It's like, first of all, that's the wrong mentality. Okay. So, uh, advantage one, they're talking about uh, how we have to get off the rock. I think that's the tag they had. It's only uninhabitable if we give up. That's their contingency. Sure, it's impossible with the slight little thing that they failed to mention is if we give up. It's not impossible right now. It's impossible if you pass their plan. Please remember that. All right, moving down to their impact, wars over resources. What if I told you, no. <laughs> no, not happening. That's so, I guess you could say it's out there. Not gonna happen. Okay, moving down to the disadvantage. Disadvantage what? You can tag this as, quite simply, save the earth. This is going to be well developed, hopefully enough, so this is going to have a lot of various subpoints under this. So, first and foremost, the uniqueness, or what's going on right now in the status quo. If none of you have heard about Earth col or Mars colonization, then I'm going to hopefully clarify that a little bit right now. So, our planet right now is on the brink. I think both teams and most of you in the audience can agree to that. The question isn't whether or not it's bleak. Right now, in the status quo, of course, there are things that need to be changed. What the negative team is trying to communicate to you is that just because the affirmative team provides you a choice to be able to do something or not do something doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. That's something to delineate. The status quo might not be perfect, but it doesn't mean that the affirmative team wouldn't make things worse. So, moving down. Uh, Essentially, there's a mind point that we have to recognize. If we were to pass the affirmative team's plan and attempt, attempt to colonize Mars, this would be a defeatist mentality. We would be basically giving up on the Earth because think of it in the, I don't know, a common man analogy. If you have a millionaire who breaks his phone, what's he gonna do? He's gonna go out and buy another one, no big deal. If you've got someone who's you know, lower income and they break their phone, oh my gosh, that's like $1,000. You're gonna take better care of it, right? That's the same mentality here is, oh, well, we've got an opportunity to maybe get off Earth. See ya. First of all, wrong mentality. Second of all, what about everybody else who's left here? Because I guarantee you that the people who are going to be going to Mars, they're not gonna be you and I. They're gonna be Jeff Bezos. They're gonna be Jeff Bezos' wife. <laughs> They're going to be people that aren't you and I. And so, please don't get caught up in this, oh, we can get off Mars, we can get off Earth, we can survive. That's not even in, you know, it's not even in discussion right now. Okay, moving down to the link, or what happens if you vote for the firm team. The plan simply passes, we abandon Earth. Right. Two set points. Again, I'm just going to reiterate this. Uh, first, we abandon this philosophically. But second of all, we abandon this fundamentally or functionally, and neither one is acceptable. We have to understand that the affirmative team, their job, as you've become acquainted with in the last 20 minutes, is that they're going to give you a chance to colonize Mars. They can give you no promises. Is it wise to vote for something that you don't really know the outcome of? No, especially when it goes against what's fundamentally right. It's not acceptable. 
Moving down to the internal link or post plan, what would happen? So this distraction would keep us from doing important research in terms of how we can actually save Earth. So really, not only if you were to vote for the affirmative team, would it not necessarily promise you anything, it would actually be detracting from our chances to save Earth, only further dooming us, which leads me to my impact. My impact is a couple fold. Actually, before I get to the impacts, there's one other thing I want to mention. You can consider this a second internal link. This plan is going to cost billions, if not trillions of dollars. What's worse, what's worse than trying to get to Mars and failing? Getting ourselves into trillions of dollars worth of debt? What a mistake. They, they can't guarantee, even though they have a you know, NASA dollar back for every dollar spent, and they might claim some kind of technology advancements, first of all, there's no guarantee. Remember, any kind of advantages they claim, there's no guarantee. So it's all hypothetical. You're going to vote for a hypothetical, or are you going to vote for what's fundamentally right to try and save the only shot we have? Moving on to the impacts. First of all, this would be a, a mind shift, which would lead to the inevitable destruction of Earth. If you are not putting our efforts into trying to save Earth, our efforts are going to be somewhere else. You can't be doing two things at once, as sure as I'm all, I'm sure we don't, we'd all like to. We'd all be able to get our classes done two times as fast and we'd all probably be a lot happier, but that's not possible. So on a grand scheme like this, when we're talking about the sustainability and future of Earth, we definitely can't say that we're going to be able to be happy in two places at once. We simply can't. There just aren't enough resources. So you're left with two options. You either decide to do what's fundamentally right and put all of our efforts into saving the Earth, the only Earth that we have, or put some rich people on Mars. Thank you. The affirmative now has one minute of flex time to ask questions of the negative. Uh, Nick, have yes. you ever got like a MRI done or, or a family member? No. That we got no. no? Fortunately, well, thank you. That technology was developed because of NASA. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was yeah. probably also an accident as well. So you and can't really guarantee any future MRIs. Oh, so you're saying MRIs are an accident? And I'm saying like that they're the not technology, like important? And... Oh, I never once would say that it's okay. not important. I'm saying that if you're hoping to gain some kind of additional advantage from your plan, such as new technologies, we're all going to be dead anyway if we don't actually take care of the Earth. So yeah. really, you can make a million inventions, but if we all end up dying anyway, it's all in vain. Yeah, well, anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, well, the technology invested in NASA where we had MRIs is also how we got like things like Velcro and sports bras, which are very important in our every everyday lives for at least for most of us women. <laughs> and, <laughs> and anyways, but that technology is like important, so. That's a fun fact, Thank Yeah, you. and every dollar. <laughs> I now recognize the member of government from the affirmative team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed five minutes. All right, for some of you uh, who are following this debate, I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of a road map. Um, I'm going to just kind of start on my opponent's uh, arguments and then move on to my team's arguments. All right, so I'll start my time uh, now. Um, pretty much their arguments just like, why not save the Earth? And uh, why not save the Earth? Like, yeah, saving the Earth is great, but the thing is, it's inevitable that Earth is going to die. Like, we have to come up with a backup plan to save like the human race. Like, what happens when we are all wiped out and we're gone? Nothing. Why not try to have a, like a backup plan to make sure that we we survive, that our race continues. Like, it's survival of the fittest, and so let's save, let's uh, come up with a backup plan and go to Mars if it's when needed, because Earth is going to die someday, so let's, per let's continue the human race. <laughs> yeah, and so he made a lot of arguments saying that uh, we're make, having this mentality of, uh, like, that we're giving up, but the thing is, investing money into NASA gets us all these great, um, in investing money into NASA always ends up in a great uh, returns because every dollar spent is into NASA is seven to eight dollars back, like I said in, the, in our uh, flex time of how we got MRIs because of NASA, how we have things like sports bras like NASA and Velcro, like simple things that are needed. So 
But it's not, um, and the thing is we're not only giving promises, we're like researching NASA is something that we can, <laughs> that we can, if that uh, investing in NASA can never really go wrong, like I said. Um, also, let's see, let's see. And also, we said that we we're never going to give up and get never. We never said we're going to give up. It's not an either or thing. It's about just survival. All right. And on to like our arguments. Let's see. Sorry. Yeah. So pretty much our arguments about getting uh, is about get off the rock, which is getting off of Earth's survival, like trying to make sure, because let's be honest, our planet is dying, and there's not, no one's making really good enough changes to keep it alive, so let's come up, uh, let's get on Mars and try to make sure that we can protect our, um, so we can continue the human race, because uh, I'll hold for uh, flux, so yeah. Um, anyways, yeah, so yeah, anyways, Mars, I mean, not Mars, yeah, getting on Mars is our best chance at survival, because Again, um, Earth is no longer be inhabitable uh, someday, and let's let's protect ourselves because, yeah. Um, anything like that, Gavin? Um, I mean, you can make the articulation that like we can always do both. Yeah. You know, there's only, we can always do both in order to try and to try and save the Earth. If we save the Earth, then that's great. Mm -hmm. If we don't, you have to do something. Yeah, and that, like my partner just said, we never said we can't do both. It's about having a backup plan to make sure that we are, that our, 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 the human race stays alive, because let's be honest, like we, we're doing a really bad job at keeping it alive right now, but we can never can, uh, we can do both and try to keep both, uh, try to stay on Earth, that would be great, but we always have to have a backup plan because, yeah, and also we did never say if we can't do both, but yeah. I mean, also the articulation that like if the Earth is going to grow or if the, is going to heat up by a, a degree and a half, which I said in my first speech, mm -hmm. then that's going to lead the ice caps to melting. People are going to be fighting over research, to, research yeah. because they don't have space. Yeah, which is like my partner said, is because uh, just like he said, also just with the uh, the uh, temperature rising will lead to the I, uh, ice caps uh, melting and waters rising, and it'll also. One thing they never even really touched on how this will possibly will lead to wars over fighting over resources, which is a, a very high possibility because, I mean, res resources we need them and there will be a competition over them and they never even address that. They and say it won't happen. Yeah, all the, all they said is like, uh, we're just giving up by having this plan, which uh, we're not giving up. It's about trying to protect ourselves. Absolutely. And I will. Uh, finish up the rest of my time. The negative now has 30 seconds of flex time to ask questions of the affirmative team. Okay. So if it's hopeless, why do people continue to make advancements in eco-friendly practices and technology and continue to make attempts, successful attempts, might I add. It may mitigate the harm, but it doesn't but it doesn't solve it. According to who? You're here. Your opinions? Oh. The, all the, whatever advancements are made in technology or like in for say like to help the environment, it doesn't mm -hmm. still doesn't change the fact that the earth is gonna heat up and we can't and we can't change that. Right. Okay. We'll be addressing that, thank you. I now recognize the member of the opposition from the negative team to deliver a constructive speech not to exceed five minutes. Hello everybody, how's it going? All right, let's keep this high energy going. All right, let's see here, okay. Okay, we are going to go on case and then we'll go off case. All right, I'm gonna start my time now. All right, so they keep saying that we can do both, but the thing is, no, because focus. All this money is gonna be going to this program that isn't even going to be guaranteed. This, may I remind you that this plan is not a guarantee, and it's just going to be expensive. So when we're putting all this money to this program that we don't even know is even going to actually work, I asked in flex time if we had the technology for it and they gave themselves the time limit of 2030. Do you think we're gonna get that technology in 10 years? Here, here. Do you? Okay, now, 
could see. Okay, and then they talk about if the earth is heating up and the ice caps melting. Well, then why are we going to put our money to something else? Why don't we try to fix that right now with the money that we're going to try to use for something else? Okay. Okay. Now, let's look at... Okay, so let's say we, we do this plan, you know. It costs a lot of money out of our pockets from taxes, and we get there. Um, once we get there, I asked in flex time about the electromagnetic field, and there are, what is it called? It's solar storms and solar flares. Mars does not have an electromagnetic field, so we'll just die once we get there. We're not going to be able to experience the innovations that are going to be created that they are talking about. So once we get there, what, like we're going to die? Like, come on, guys. So, which is why we should be putting this money towards fixing Earth right now. We should not give up on Earth. So when you look at this debate, there are two sides to this, since you are the judge, all right? So, in the world of the affirmative where you pass this plan, it's going to cost a lot of money out of all of our pockets, and then, it's, not, it's probably not even gonna happen, I'm sorry, because we're not even gonna have the technology in 10 years, so we're just putting money to something that's really not gonna happen. Anyways, now, in the world of the negation, we can save Earth. We can put this money to the problems that we have now. Let's not give up on Earth. And it is for those reasons, audience, that you will be voting for the negation. Thank you. I now recognize the leader of the opposition from the negative team to deliver a rebuttal speech not to exceed two minutes. All right, quick roadmap. I'm gonna be starting off by responding to their advantages, what's responded to their advantages in the last speech, and then ending with a few voting issues, basically some boil down reasons as to why you should be voting for the negative team. Ready? All right. Colonizing Mars is a pipe dream. It's not gonna happen. We've hopefully made that clear to you by this point. However, I'd like to reiterate some of the reasons, some of the scientific evidence and empirics as well as to why this has not been proven to be reliable and why people are starting to put so much effort into generating technology that can help save Earth instead of generating technology that can help us in space. Because these are scientists, please keep in mind, these are people who know a lot more about this than any of the four of us. And these scientists have determined that their time, their research, and their money is worth putting into technology that will save Earth. They're doing this for a reason. Believe it or not, scientists do not develop things mindlessly, as some people might like you to believe. Okay, moving down to their advantage. They responded to my argument about this is only uninhabitable if we give up, and they said that this is our best chance of survival. Simply put, incorrect. It's not true. It's not true because if we look to the people who actually have a shot of saving us, they say that it is possible. Simply enough. All right, moving down to, uh, they're talking about ice caps are gonna melt and wars might start. We admit that there's a problem. We admitted right out of the beginning that there's a problem and that Earth is not on the right track. The difference between these two teams is how we're going to be going about fixing it. If you believe that we should do what's proper, do what's morally right, and to try and save the one Earth that we have a guarantee of potentially saving, compared to Mars, which is, again, very out there, very unlikely, and frankly, people aren't developing that kind of research right now for a reason, then you'd be voting for the affirmative team. However, I'm gonna be addressing my voting issues as to why I would highly recommend against not doing that. First of all, this is principally wrong. We've addressed this. I don't wanna beat a dead horse. I really like animals. <laughs> but this is fundamentally wrong, and that's my voting issue too, is that not only is this a wrong mentality to have and will only guarantee the damnation of this earth, but it would be wrong monetarily wise because we're going to be putting ourselves in debt for as long as we're alive. I mean, I guess the debt doesn't really matter if they're going to end up killing us. And that's time. Here, here. All right, thank you. Please vote negative.
The affirmative now has 30 seconds of flex time to ask questions of the negative team. Okay, so you say that it's infeasible to get to Mars by 2030. Do you know when JFK uh, made his Man on the Moon speech? And do you know how long afterwards it took us to actually get a Man on the Moon? The answer is nine years. Okay. Here, here. So, say that it's unfeasible, I think it's unrealistic if we're not even going to Oh, try. I'm not the one saying it's not feasible, it's the experts who are saying it's not feasible. <laughs> I will take credit for that. I now recognize the Prime Minister from the affirmative team to deliver a rebuttal speech not to exceed three minutes. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, before uh, the end of this round, I'd just like to thank everybody all for coming out and uh, for listening to this great debate. And thanks, uh, Nick, and uh, his excellent opinions for uh, <laughs> his uh, inclusion in, the, in this round. So uh, is, if uh, everybody is ready, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm going to put it. Uh, I'm going to put this round in perspective for you guys. So they say that it's not that it is mutually exclusive that you can't both try to save the Earth be, and you, and also try to go to Mars due to financial constraints. Since when has financial constraints been the been a drawback to getting anything done for the hum, for humankind? When JFK said he wanted to get a man on the moon, he put all the money that were required to do it, and they got it done. And I was in the middle of the Cold War in which they wanted to nuke each other into oblivion. Here, here. So, now, let's now, I, let me put it in a different perspective for you. Rome was destroyed because of climate change. Because due to the Huns uh, moving from the uninhabitable steppes due to a one degree change over time, led to the destruction of the greatest civilization in human history. We're talking about a one and a half degree that is unable to be that is unable to be avoided, no matter what. And that what that is going to mean is that the ice caps are going to melt, and we're going to fight over limited resources because humans are going to be pushed away from the sea, from the oceans inward, and there's going to be fight over resources between countries. That is where the new, that is where the war scenario that we're talking about happens, and that is irrevoidable no matter what we try to do about climate. So no matter what, that is always happening, and that's something we try to avoid because otherwise we might blow each other to bits and then nobody's getting to Mars because everybody's dead anyway. <laughs> so, um, on that note, it would be, would be kind of nice to have a plan B if, that, if that's an option. So, if the net, on a net beneficial level, a net beneficial scale, if we have the complete destruction of all Earth through war and people killing off each other, and some people potentially being able to colonize another country, or the alternative scenario in which neither happens and the Earth continues on okay, and we invest a bunch of money into space in which we get a bunch of other cool new inventions like Velcro and the MRI and everything, that's also pretty cool too. Um, ultimately, we should be giving more money into the space, into the space uh, uh, program anyway because it's always been proven net beneficial in the, in the squirrel. So again, it's 2019. We have 11 years, which we gave, which we gave as a reason to get to Mars. We got a man on the moon in nine. Why? They say that it's unfeasible, but they don't give any particular reasoning as to real why it's not. Other than, oh, experts say that it is. Since when it, have experts always been right? Have experts ever been proven wrong? Why don't we at least give it a try? Because we can ultimately try to save the Earth and also have a backup just in case. So. Ultimately, in this round, the only real like articulation that the, that the negative negative is has brought up in this uh, in this round is that it's going is that we can't do both, and so their impacts already trigger, always trigger that it always is bad for them. However, why can't we all just pull together and try to pull and try to make the world a better place and also explore the stars? Vote for the apartment. <laughs> applause for the MJC speech and debate team. Well, that is most certainly a stellar debate, but debates do have winners and they do have losers, and we're going to do decide that right now. So, if at the end of this debate, when you weighed all of the arguments, you felt that the affirmative team upheld their burden and convinced you that doing this plan would make the status quo better, let me hear you now. Round the negative.
team has done their job and convinced you that we ought to stick with the status quo, let me hear you now. 